Okay. Well, in case you didn't know, uh, we've had a bit of a delay here. We had to completely take out and put in a new soundboard. So thankfully there are people here that know what they're doing that were able to do that. Today we're going to talk about unprecedented, <laughs> unprecedented convergence. And uh, we talk each week about convergence. I'm getting a lot of echo. Do you want me to keep going? What? Okay. So you'll just have to, those listening live will just have to kind of put up with that. It is a little bit disconcerting, but we talk each week about the convergence of events. And this is, again, was another week in which we saw a lot of that occurring. Uh, the world is in uh, quite a state of disruption. I wanted to uh, give you a heads up in case you're in Great Britain, United Kingdom, and you want to go to the conference, the Moriel Conference at Hayes Conference Center, November 16th to the 18th. I'll be speaking with John Peters and Jacob Prash at the Israel Prophecy and Youth Conference. You can go to the Moriel.org website and sign up for that. The, um, so let's look at a few things that went on this week. I don't have too many comments on this. This was this continual uh, fake drama around the hearings that were going on for Judge Kavanaugh to be a justice on the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, it concluded on Thursday night with, or Friday morning, with Diane Feinstein, who many people have heretofore considered a rather reasonable person, coming out with a totally um, anonymous letter about uh, an unspecified incident that occurred that she felt she needed to refer to the FBI for investigation without the name of anybody involved. This was a complete political hit job. Um, I just want you to know that uh, in case I ever run for judge, that uh, in grade school, I once passed a note to a girl. Uh, I, I soon learned that the best way to do that was to uh, use an intermediary, and uh, in which case the girl sent an intermediary back, uh, does John like me? And my response was, well, yeah, as a friend. And uh, <laughs> I was 12 years old, I didn't know what to do. I didn't even know what to do when I, I met my wife, so. <laughs> I've told you those stories. Um, Bible prophecy is an interesting subject. In Isaiah chapter 46, it says this, verse 9, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executeth my counsel from a far country, yea, I have spoken it, I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it, I will also do it. Hearken unto me, ye stout-hearted that are from, far from righteousness. I will bring near my righteousness. It shall not be far off, and my salvation shall not tarry, and I will place salvation in Zion for Israel my glory. But back to verse 9. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. One of the things that we often forget when we study Bible prophecy is that Jewish prophecy is very often a pattern. A pattern is established and it recapitulates, it repeats itself throughout Scripture. And this is the way prophecy often works. And so when we talk about the beginning, where do we go for the beginning? A lot of times when we start Bible prophecy, we go to the end. We go to Revelation. But sometimes we need to go back to the beginning to understand the big picture narrative of what's going on in Scripture. I say this because recently there has been a concerted attack. And I think one of the things that I find most disturbing about modern culture is the attack on sex, gender, and the family. 
back in 2014, the time cover on the left appeared, the transgender tipping point, America's next civil rights frontier. Now, in hindsight, that time cover seems to be very, very prophetic because it did lay out what was going to happen. This, this came out a year before the Supreme Court's decision in Obergefell that approved same-sex marriage. Three years later, Time came out with a cover that said beyond he or she. Even magazines that you would not expect to come out with these things, National Geographic, The Gender Revolution. The National Geographic did a special issue on the gender revolution. Universities all over the country are doing things. This is for an article about what's going on at the University of Minnesota, which I may have mentioned a couple of months ago. He, she, or they. Pronouns could, impose, could pose trouble under University of Minnesota campus policy. Now, they have a draft policy. I don't know if it's been adopted yet. But if you, ref if you refer to someone in a way other than their chosen j pronoun, you can be, if you're a student, you can be expelled. If you're a faculty or staff member, you can be fired. That's what, the, that's what Minnesota is proposing to do. A, few, a couple weeks ago, a study came out in uh, a pediatric-related journal, and it was a study called Rapid Onset Gender Dysphoria in Adolescents and Young Adults, a Study of Parental Reports. It was it was done by a uh, Brown, Reese, a Brown uh, University. It was done by a Brown University researcher. She decided that uh, she had received, seen these reports where parents were saying, "My kid was fine, and all of a sudden now they want to identify as a different gender." What's going on? Brown University, of course, was very proud of this. They, they're an Ivy League school. By the way, I have a friend who has a son and daughter at an Ivy League school. Um, I said, what's the damage? What's the tuition cost? He said, well, with the fraternity sorority payments and tuition room, that's $2,000 a year for the fraternity and sorority for each child. They, their tuition room and board is $76,000 per year. Now, Brown University was very proud of this. Brown researcher first to describe raps, rapid onset gender dys, dysphoria. Dysphoria is they, they don't know what they want. They don't know what they are. They can't decide whether they're male or female. It's a, it's a mental condition. It's being facilitated by the way culture and society is going. And I think it's having an impact, which this Brown University researcher discovered, and she wrote an article about it. Brown University has now taken down their webpage where they announced this study because the transgender activists have said, you can't talk about this. You can't talk about the fact that there's a rapid onset. Why? Because, well, people must be born this way. This is infecting anything, everything. In the Wall Street Journal this week, they had an article about trans, peer pressure and transgender um, icons. And uh, let me just see now my, I'm sure my thing is going to, everything else is not seems to be working today, so let's make sure that this, uh, You know, this is, you know, you would think that this is almost somebody trying to do this on purpose. So now I gotta find the article. Okay, here we go. So she said this, Dr. Lippmann's study about transgender identifying teens was published in the open source multi multi multidisciplinary scientific journal. Her interest had been peaked in 2016 when she noticed an uptick in parental reports that teens had suddenly insisted their gender identity didn't match their sex, although they'd shown some of the common prepubescent signs of the condition known as gender, gender dysphoria. 
Since little is known about such rapid onset gender dysphoria, the first step for researchers is to describe it and introduce topics for future inquiry. Well, the article goes on to say, talks about the fact that critics came out and said, oh, you, you really can't talk about this, your study's not right, you shouldn't be talking about this. It says this about what she found in her study. The parents she surveyed, the parents she surveyed are generally liberal in attitude. More than 85% said they support gay marriage, and only 3% disagreed with the proposition that transgender people deserve this, the same rights and protections as others. Dr. Lippmann's detractors accuse her of bigotry. Her work negates the experience of many transgender youth, according to Diane Earhart. Transgender activist Brian Tannehill called Dr. Lippmann's research, quote, a naked attempt to legitimize anti-transgender animus with a veneer of academic responsibility. Another person called it a hoax diagnosis perpetrated by those who would deny transgender children acceptance and affirmation. This study comes on the heels of reports like here's the LGBTQ report from the Human Rights Campaign that talks about the fact that transgender youth have a much higher rate of suicide than any other category. In fact, there's a study in the American Journal of P Academy of Pediatrics Journal that talked about the fact they, they looked at six gender identity groups, female, male, transgender male to female, transgender female to male, transgender not exclusively male or female, and questioning. Now, I'm not sure how you distinguish between the last two questions, the last two, but they, what they found was that there was an incredible increase in suicide rates, especially among, I believe it was females going to male, or maybe it was, I, I don't know, one of them was almost, was over 50% had, had attempted suicide. And this, you know, this is heartbreaking. But if we go back to the beginning, Jesus was inquired of by the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 19. The Pharisees also came to him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put his wife away for every cause? And what Jesus did was he went back to the beginning. And he said, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And what you have today in society and culture, and this is worldwide, is an attempt to erase that distinction, that God created, God ordained distinction. And as a result, children and others who suffer from this problem are being driven to suicide. The blood of all of those is on the hands, not of the people who want to stop it, but of the people who encourage it. And it is a growing phenomenon. I saw a video this week of a pop star. Um, the song was called Born This Way. Lady Gaga. She has a new movie coming out because they're trying to make her more mainstream. And they had dancers. You know, it's a catchy tune. It's a... You know, if it was on American Bandstand, it'd be one of those ones, oh yeah, it's great to dance to. But there were many dancers, but I looked at them, and to be honest with you, I could not tell whether they were male or female. Because one of the things she tries to do is to blur the distinction. And this encourages suicide. Even the people that have worked in this area say, this, this just cannot be done. I don't have really time to go into this. The Pope has called a meeting to deal with sexual abuse in the Roman Catholic Church. Prior to the meeting, he first said he was going to be silent, and then he said, well, the accuser of the brethren has become unchained and won't, and he won't acknowledge the cause. He won't deal with the problem. I'll probably have more to say about it as things unfold. 
I want to talk the rest of the time about anti-Semitism and Middle East geopolitics. Um, former Canadian Prime Minister Brian Harper came out this week and said that the left people like, I want to make sure it's the Canadian Prime Minister, yeah, it's in the Toronto Sun, uh, Jeremy Corbyn and others on the left are anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish. And it, should, it is very clear that they are. I've talked about this the last few weeks. And nobody really calls them on it in that community because, well, I guess it's okay. The chief rabbi in Britain spoke in the House of Lords the other day about this problem of anti-Semitism in Great Britain, and this is what he had to say. My lords, I am so grateful to Lord Popat for in initiating this debate, and I want to explain why. The greatest danger any civilization faces is when it suffers collective amnesia. We forget how small beginnings lead to truly terrible endings. A thousand years of Jewish history in Europe added certain words to the human vocabulary, forced conversion, inquisition, expulsion, ghetto, pogrom, holocaust. They happened because hate went unchecked. No one said stop. My lords, it pains me to speak about anti-Semitism, the world's oldest hatred, but I cannot keep silent. One of the enduring facts of history is that most anti-Semites do not think of themselves as anti-Semites. We don't hate Jews, they said in the Middle Ages, just their religion. We don't hate Jews, they said in the 19th century, just their race. We don't hate Jews, they say now, just their nation state. Anti-Semitism is the hardest of all hatreds to defeat because like a virus it mutates, but one thing stays the same. Jews, whether as a religion or a race or as the state of Israel, are made the scapegoats for problems for which all sides are responsible. That is how the road to tragedy begins. Anti-Semitism or any hate becomes dangerous when three things happen. First, when it moves from the fringes of politics to a mainstream party and its leadership. Second, when the party sees that its popularity with the general public is not harmed thereby. And three, when those who stand up and protest are vilified and abused for doing so. All three factors exist in Britain now. I never thought I would see this in my lifetime. That is why I cannot stay silent for it is not only Jews who are at risk, so too is our humanity. Yeah. Good thoughts. I'm going to end with something that's related to that, but let's cover a few other things before we get there. I've talked about this a number of times before. The um, social credit score. Um, hang on, I want to check something here. The... Um, so I see only half of my slides are showing up on the video. Hang on a second here. It's like every, nothing's working today, so please be patient with us. Okay, I'm not sure what's I'm not sure what's going on there. So I talked about the social credit score that is um, excuse me a second. It's a little hard to do this and continue to talk with everything. So please um, bear with me. 
Okay, social credit score in China. This is very concerning. I was reading articles this week where people in China are being denied the ability to get on a train to go places, the ability to get on a plane to go places, because their social credit score is not high enough. And China society is adopting this. In fact, they're even setting up within communities sort of a, con a condominium association. They're setting up micro credit scores for people, whether they're good <laughs> neighbors or not. I say this because uh, Google is t partnering with China to introduce a censored search engine. There have been at least five of the leading engineers for Google that have resigned in protest. You saw the, the video this week about uh, Google, I, maybe you saw that where they were upset the day, the week after the Trump election and how they were going to stop this. And the, the threat to free speech often doesn't come from, um, from government, it comes from corporate fascists that want to control everything. And this is what, it's, this is what they're all about. It's very concerning. China this week instituted a, a, a very strict program of persecution of Christians. In fact, somebody sent me an email about, let's see, I'm going to, in fact, I'll read it right now. Things don't really want to work today. Pastor Wang Yi said this in a sermon to his congregation. Churches are being burned, people are being locked up, people are being rounded up. And he said this, all the, the weaknesses we experience in Christian life, why are you still caught up in lies? Why are you still lingering in all of that sordid malice? Is it because you are afraid of persecution? It is because you are afraid of persecution. It is because you do not believe that persecution is a blessing from God. For God says that it is the one who takes up his cross and follows me, who renounces all that he has in this life, will also gain what in this life? He shall receive a hundredfold in this age to come, eternal life. A hundredfold of what in this life? One of the important things that the Lord Jesus meant in this, meant in this life is persecution. And that list of blessings is the persecution of the world against us. So let me put it this way. When truth and justice prevail in our nation, we must speak honestly. We must live upright lives. We must speak edifying words. And when truth and justice wane, we must still speak honestly. We must act and speak with the same courage as we did before. When we are not being persecuted, we spread the gospel. When we are not being persecuted, we go street preaching. And when persecution comes... We continue street preaching. When we are talking about a president, we declare that he is a sinner. We believe that we have the responsibility to tell Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping that he is a sinner. This government that he is leading has sinned greatly against God, and if he does not repent, he will perish. We declare that there is still a way of escape for an evil man like him. But there is only one way out, and that is the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. We say this because we truly believe that this is for his good and for every government worker. We do not want to see them go to hell. We do not want to see them and their descendants cursed by God. If we do not experience persecution, how are we to give them the grace of the gospel? What are the means of giving them this gospel of grace? He did it through Gethsemane. He did it through the cross of Golgotha. What means does the Chinese church today use to give the grace of gospel who resists and persecutes the church of God? But it is concerning. I, you know, look, I want to live a comfortable life. I don't want to live an uncomfortable life. But we also have to be honest and speak honestly about what's coming. The world is a mess. This is something that's not often talked about. This is Yemen. And you can see how Yemen's divided by 
the uh, Al Qaeda forces in blue, the Houthi rebels that are supported by Iran in gold or yellow, and the other lighter shade color is the ones that are pro uh, protected by the Saudis. There are a lot of people that live in Yemen, upwards of 40 million people. We don't even think about it. When I did that uh, uh, post, or I showed you those slides of the largest cities in the world in 2100, a couple of them are in Yemen and will be cities of about 30 million people. But they don't have, of course, you know, it's a desert area. They have very little water. It's strategically located. People, you can see down here where the purple and gold come together in the lower left-hand corner, there's a strait there. And that is the Strait of the Red Sea. And so China, Russia, United States, a bunch of countries are trying to control that strait. Iran wants to control it. That's why they're supporting the Houthi rebels. Do you really want Iran to control that strait, which leads to the Suez Canal and the Strait of Hormuz, through which at least a third of the world's oil passes? That's, that's what these wars are about. They're about control of these vital resources. But here's a, this is a survey. Total population, 2060, I'm sorry, it wasn't 40 million, it's 27.5 million live in Yemen. That's more people than lived in Syria at the start of the Syrian civil war. That was about 21 or 22 million. Again, it's one of those things where it's a, a large number of people live there, <laughs> But we don't even, it's not really even on our radar screen. But listen to this. Today, out of 27 and a half million people, 18 million people are food insecure. Eight and a half million or 8.4 million people don't know when their next meal will be. That would be equivalent in the United States would be 80 million people not knowing where their next meal would come from. Uh, 22 million people need humanitarian aid and protection. In Iraq, I think this has per per, uh, prophetic significance. There are riots going on. I think they elected somebody to become the head of the government finally yesterday. They had elections a few months ago. There are riots going on in Basra. It is a heavily Shiite area. About 70% of Iraqi's oil resources are located in that, pro in that area. But there are riots going on, Shia Muslim against Shia Muslim, because of what's happening. And what's happening is, we know from the Bible, there are two important rivers in Iraq, ancient Babylon, the Tigris and the Euphrates. Those rivers are drying up. There are millions of people at risk because of lack of water. Because there's lack of water, there's lack of power. Because there's lack of power, there's lack of sewage control and water purification. Cholera is growing. People don't have food to eat. They don't have water to drink. And there are riots that are going on. The drying up of those rivers, I think, is pretty significant. The Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs has an article that came out last week titled, Iran and Turkey Divert Iraq's River Waters, Leaving Iraq on the Brink of Catastrophe. How many of you have really heard about this in the news? I've seen it covered by Jonathan Spire and some others in the Jerusalem Post, but virtually nowhere else. Because, see, Iran has been having a pretty severe drought, and so they've been diverting water resources. It's not too dissimilar from what the concern has been in Egypt, as Ethiopia has built a very large dam uh, that will interrupt the flow from the headwaters of the Nile River. I believe that might be also discussed in Bible prophecy. You can read about that in the book of Isaiah. And Egypt will have, as, as uh, Ethiopia tries to fill, fill the lake, the reservoir behind the dam, over the next few years, it will put great strains on Egypt, which has somewhere around 90 million people. And when people don't have water, what do they do? 
They do the same thing that we do here in America when we have too much water, called flooding, is we go someplace else. And so they will immigrate, and that will put strain on resources in other countries. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big issue. Here's what one of the paragraphs in that article on the JCPA says. Global attention has been focused on the strained Ethiopian Egyptian relations due to the construction of the Renaissance Dam by Ethiopia on the Blue Nile, whose reservoir, once filled, will probably lower the level of the Nile by one, or two, one to two meters, delivering a severe blow to Egyptian life along the Nile River. But little attention has been given to the brewing conflict over the Tigris and Euphrates waters, both iconic rivers on which Iraq's existence in both ancient and modern times has always depended. And we know in Revelation it says that the river Euphrates will be dried up. Turkey currently has plans. They have massive dams along the Euphrates River. It's interrupting the flow. Turkey's going to protect themselves first with the water resources. And Turkey is proposing to build not one, not two, not three, but 42 additional dams in the Euphrates River Basin. Now, part of the reason that Turkey, as I mentioned this when I talked about some of the big projects that Erdogan has in place, is he wants to build these dams to create reservoirs that will prevent people he doesn't like from communicating with other people that he doesn't like and maybe fomenting a revolution against him. There are, there are, strategic, defensive, there are strategic defense dams and reservoirs. Jonathan Spire has a good article. It's appeared in a number of places. Mounting unease beneath the calm in a Syrian enclave. And he talks about some of the key dates. You can look up the article. It was in the Weekend Australian. It's also available on his uh, Facebook page and um, the Middle East think tank that he writes for. I cannot remember the name of it off the top of my head. Just Google mounting unease beneath the calm in a Syrian enclave. And he talks about the things that um, are going on in Syria, have been going on in Syria, and that are leading to this conflict in Idlib province. Uh, he says this, here's just some quotes from the article. What happens next in Idlib depends on how much control Russia has over Assad and whether Russia thinks Turkey, which has had strained relations with Washington of late, will pivot back to the Western orbit. For Assad, retaking control of the entire country is his top priority, but for Russia, there, which has supported Assad in the civil war since 2015, its interests go far beyond this small corner of northwest Syria. If Russia can help Turkey from turning back to the west, it will hesitate to launch a major offensive in the province. But if it believes this realignment is out of reach, it will be more likely to support ground operations, even if it risks threatening Turkish forces in the area. So what's going on is, that, look, we talk about Bible prophecy and we see the meetings that are going on with Turkey and Iran and Russia. And we get very excited about Bible prophecy. Is Bible prophecy being fulfilled? Is Ezekiel 38 going to happen next week? And that type of thing. And my contention is that things are lining up, but it's not quite there yet. Um, let's see. George Friedman over at Geopolitical Futures has another, has a great article called um, Why Idlib Matters. And I'll summarize it just for, in the interest of time. But what he says is, it's, it's, what's going on in Idlib is very complicated. Rather than a strict alignment between Russia, Iran, and Turkey, is you have each of these countries sort of in a standoff as to how they're going to react. Iran will support the Syrian regime without question. Part of that is because they're being hammered by sanctions. And they know that November 4th additional sanctions are going to come on. In fact, Tur uh, India, one of the largest oil customers of Iran, has cut its oil traffic almost in half, even though sanctions have not yet come into effect. 
So Iran is looking for money and cash and resources, and they figured that they could profit from the rebuilding of Syria. And if you've looked at pictures, and we've shown them many times, pictures of Syrian cities that have been reduced to rubble, those are going to have to be rebuilt. Uh, what Assad has done with the Iranian help has essentially driven out most of the Sunnis, and those cities will re be rebuilt and they will be repopulated with Shia. And a lot of those Shia may come from Iraq. Because why? Well, Iraq has problems right now. So we're, we live at a, a time when there's this massive change going on in the Middle East. So Iran will flow in with the Syrian regime, but what will Russia do? Well, Russia, you know, they have their uh, interests. They got their base. They got their naval port there in Tartus. They have a, a couple air bases in Latakia. But I think Russia is sort of interested in getting out of Syria. Now, personally, rather than saying, oh, well, that means Ezekiel 38 is a ways off, I think it maybe make it, might make it more close. And the reason for that is there are passages, I've mentioned them a couple times, in Ezekiel 38 and 39, where it talks about the leader of this coalition, and assuming it's Russia, I will, what, turn you back. Now, to me, that implies that they've been there and they've left, and now they're being drugged back in. So Russia doesn't want to engage the United States recently. It also says that this army that comes against Israel is a mighty army. And while I think Russia does have tremendous military resources, we also know that it's a country that has an economy that's smaller than the state of Texas. Did you know that? So they spend a lot of money on their resources. They had a massive uh, exercise this year, or the, just this week, with China. 300,000 Russian troops, tanks, aircraft that took place in Siberia, near China. Now, they had a lot of resources there. They had what I would term a mighty army there. But Siberia is not northern Syria or southern Syria, and it would take a while to get all of those people from China, from Siberia, down to northern Israel for an invasion. And I should sometime do something that I think when we talk about Bible prophecy we don't think about sometimes, is the logistics. A mighty army. How does that happen? depending on your view of Revelation and the 200 million man army from the kings of the east that comes, how do you get 200 million men from China and the east to the Middle East? Well, you put roads in place, you put railways in place, which China has been doing, called the Belt Road Initiative. But it's not totally in place right now, so just uh, keep that in mind. But Friedman, says that pay attention to Idlib, it's very volatile, the United States has assets there in Syria, what's going to happen? It was announced uh, I think yesterday that Syria says well we're going to postpone the offensive in Idlib for about three weeks at least. Turkey moved a lot of armored equipment into their area north of Idlib that they're controlling. They don't, want those Syri they don't want those millions of refugees. They already have four and a half million Syrians there, refugees. It's straining the resources of their country. So they moved in, and Russia's kind of backed off a little bit, I think. So look, it's something we need to pay attention to. It's going to be very volatile for a long time. It's, I, think, I don't think it's ever going to be resolved until the Lord returns, but just pay attention to it. But I don't think we should be running around saying Ezekiel 38 is tomorrow. I don't think it is. But, you know, it, things could change very quickly, and they do all the time. Um, let's see. In fact, this, is, this was a picture taken, some pictures taken yesterday. Oh, here it is. Of protest in Idlib against the Syrian regime. Uh, this has not happened for quite a while during the civil war that's been going on in Syria. I'm sure that Assad did not like it. In Damascus last night, there were missile attacks close to the Damascus airport. Exactly, um, Syria came out and said, 
We shot down Israeli missiles, but I've seen video and pictures of missiles exploding. There was also a, signif a couple significant things, and I'll close with this if you'll just bear with me for a few minutes. This was a significant week in that, I mentioned this last Sunday, uh, September 13th was the 25th the anniversary of the signing of the Oslo Accords on the lawn of the White House before 3,000, a crowd of 3,000 people. And this involved the, uh, the handshake between Rabin and Arafat. It was uh, a little over a year later that Rabin was assassinated at a peace rally in Tel Aviv. There is a documentary out right now. I, it's, I think it's on home box office. I was watching it last night about Oslo. And it interviews people and it has interviews with Rabin. And Rabin was very negative in the interview towards Jewish settlers. Oh, they fashioned themselves as pioneers. They're just a big problem. And a activist assassinated him. I think he was clearly wrong. There were a lot of articles this week, the grim cost of the Oslo War, articles in the New York Times 25 years later, Mideast peace seems remote as ever. The Gatestone Institute had an article about the grim cost of war. Look at what they said. They quoted, this is mostly quoting an article by Daniel Pipes. What happened in Oslo was this, because we know it led to a couple of intifadas, thousands of people dead on both sides, terror bombings, the Sabaro Pizza Parlor and other places in Jerusalem, children killed, people of all ages killed. Overnight, the problem with Oslo was this, overnight Yasser Arafat was no longer the leader of a defeated terrorist organization. He had suddenly become the president of a quasi-state. The PLO had been transformed into the Palestinian Authority. To the contrary, Israeli compromises aggravated Palestinian hostility. Each gesture further radicalized, exhilarated, and mobilized the Palestinian body politic. Israeli efforts to make peace were received as signs of demoralization and weakness. Painful concessions reduced the Palestinian awe of Israel, made the Jewish state appear vulnerable, and inspired irredentist dreams of annihilation. In retrospect, this does not surprise. Contrary to Rabin's slogan, one does not make peace with unsavory, very unsavory enemies, rather one, but rather you make peace with former very unsavory enemies, that is, enemies that have been defeated. Wars end, the historical record shows, not through goodwill, but through defeat. He who does not win loses. Wars usually end when failure causes one side to despair, when that side has abandoned its war aims and accepted defeat, and when that defeat has exhausted its will to fight. Conversely, so long as combat, both combatants hope to achieve their war objectives, fighting either goes on or potentially will resume. And so it didn't resolve anything. Seth Ransman has a good article in the Jerusalem Post this week talking about this called the um, Oslo's Poison Ch Chalice. He says this, the Oslo Accords developed out of the context of the 1990s when they were signed. They were a response to the world in which the Moscow patrons of the Arab states that opposed Israel had retreated inward, in which the Palestine, Palestinian desire for revolution was meeting with reality. The Europeans, especially through those extremists, thought, they thought the extremists on the Palestinian side could be sidelined. They even invested in programs to influence Israelis to make them support peace. They didn't understand that one bus bombing made all of the peace investment from peace journalism to, co to coexistence a sunk cost. People can't be bribed to make peace. They don't want to die in a bus bombing just so other people can be peacemakers. The Palestinian leadership saw benefits. 
They stole billions of dollars of aid that had come in. He concludes with this. There is an illusion of an agreement about all those final status issues, such as refugees in Jerusalem. To house those illusions, the Palestinians built a giant, hulking, brutalist parliament building in Abu Dis in the 1990s. And that's a picture of it today. It lies empty today, as empty as the hope for an Oslo-style peace. You can go to Jerusalem and you can see that. The president also is pushing forward with a peace plan. The very interesting part of this is, this is from New York Times and other things. In fact, it's in the, the, uh, the Woodward book, the Bob, Robert Woodward book, Bob Woodward book that came out about the presidency. It talks about Jared Kushner quite a bit. Um, I think it's something that bears watching. It's one thing that I watch. You know that Kushner, when they were trying to decide where the president goes first on a foreign trip, he pushed for Saudi Arabia. And he has very close ties to Israeli intelligence, and he told everybody that who you need to meet with when you go there is the deputy crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman. The intelligence people in the United States pretty much said, you don't know what you're talking about. He's not, he's not even the crown prince but he soon, he soon became the crown prince. Now, he's having some trouble with his reforms and everything, but um, it just shows that you know, Kushner went against the intelligence deep state in America and pushed the president into this. So it's hard to know exactly where this is going. But the president's staff, they have been um, pushing this. There's just some tweets from Jared... Uh, Jason Greenblatt the other day, you know, when he issues these tweets about Middle East peace, he always sends them out in Hebrew, Arabic, and English. The advice that I would give everybody, wait until the peace plan is released. When it's released, please read it cover to cover and judge the plan on the merits, uh, its merits, not on rumors, not on speculation, not on news reports, but what's in it. So, so send it to me and I'll take a look at it. Good article from Caroline Glick <coughs> about uh, Trump ending the Palestinian exception. There was a speech by John Bolton this week, and this is, comes out of what Jared Kushner wants to push. He says, okay, look, you won't negotiate Palestinians, we're cutting you off. And so they've cut off hundreds, tens of millions of dollars in aid. At the same time that this is going on, I did not mention this last week, there was the birth in Israel. This was announced by the Temple Institute of a Red Heifer. And everybody says, well, what's so significant about that? We know the Bible prophecy says that there will be a temple built in Jerusalem. The people in charge of that, uh, based on Numbers 19, need a red heifer. The red heifer, after it reaches the age of two, if it is still qualifying, meaning it is totally red, they have a very elaborate test as to determine whether it's without blemish. It's based on Numbers chapter 19, but they also have other rules that they've put in. So it can't have any white hairs. Well, if it does have a white hair, it can only be limited. I think there's two that it could have. And as long as the, this is a, on a heifer. <laughs> so the people have spent their time examining this. And they, this is the first one born that appears to qualify that's been born in Israel. That's very significant. And the reason for that is that the red heifer will be sacrificed after it reaches the age of two. It has to be a qualifying red heifer at the age of two. This one was just born, so it's not going to be meet final qualifications for two years. So keep that in mind, because that uh, red heifer must be sacrificed, and the blood and ashes used in purification ceremonies to purify where the temple is going to be built and the people who are going to build the temple. Uh, and there, as I said, very elaborate rules. You can read all about a lot of them in Numbers chapter 19. So the people in charge are like, and look, the Temple Institute thinks that this is very significant. And it is, because it is the first one born in Israel. And there is this expectation 
of the coming temple. This is one of the videos that the Temple Institute has released over time about the coming temple. This is called The Children Are Ready. Just look at this. This is taken near the Temple Mount and just watch what happens. Now, this is what the Temple Institute is putting out. They put out videos with the plans for the coming temple. And I've said to you before that I have great concerns about this because the true temple will be built by Jesus when he returns, but there will be a temple that will be a tool of the Antichrist that will be built before that. So while I get excited when I see this, I'm also concerned because it's, these are false signs. These, these, are, these are signs of a coming antichrist, in my view. But God has placed in our heart this desire of people, Jewish people, for Israel in Jerusalem. We've seen a lot of things happen with Jerusalem over the last year. The president moved our embassy, the United States embassy, to Jerusalem. Other countries have moved their embassies to Jerusalem and are considering doing so. Uh, I'm going to close with this. Um, I had a Facebook friend until this morning. Ari Fold, 45, father of four, a IDF reservist. He still worked, showed up at the IDF even though he was past the age. Um, to describe him as larger than life would be an understatement. I never got to meet him face to face. I hope to the next time we got to Israel. It was on my list. At Gushi Tzion this morning, uh, down near the Herodian, this is, this is not bloody by any stretch of the imagination. This is actual video at the shopping center there. He is on the far right along the wall. You see another person pass, and then the gentleman in the uh, black will stab Ari. He falls, he gets up, and you see him running here, chasing and shooting the terrorist. And you'll see him running with a picture here in the blue shirt. And he then collapsed and died. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, put a post on his Facebook page as a tribute to Ari. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Avi Abelo. I'm a childhood friend of Ari Folds. And I have been uh, Zolcha. Uh, had the, the privilege 
of being able to sit next to Ari every day in synagogue, Sabbaths, holidays, every morning. It's very hard for me, a good friend for <laughs> close to 40 years, and a warrior for Israel. Ari was murdered just a few hours ago in, in Kushetzion by a Muslim terrorist. Ari, the lion, the warrior who you all follow. It's hard. It's hard to imagine. One of the strongest among us all. But yes, even Ari was murdered by our horrible, evil enemies. Ari stood for truth, everybody. Ari stood for truth. And you may have seen his videos. Um, I used one recently when, in, in one of my updates about Hebron, where he went down and showed how when they closed uh, for the Muslim holiday, they closed the synagogue down, Hebron, and the Muslims came in and they broke off all of the little, uh, the places, the, the things that they keep the uh, verses in on their doorposts. They just came in and destroyed them. And he went through and he showed this. He was a, he was a warrior for Israel. He was uh, very bold. He was large in life. Ari means lion. Um, and so he was at Gushi Etzion at the shopping mall there today and uh, was stabbed to death by a Muslim terrorist. I, um, I think this is significant. I don't know what the reaction will be. We know that there's a coming time of oppression in Israel and in Jerusalem. But there's a good end to the story, so I'll just close with this passage. Zechariah chapter 12. The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretches forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth. Do you see what they did there? Zechariah went back to the beginning. Which stretches forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth and formeth the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem, a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, when they shall be in the siege both against Judah, which is where Gish Etzion is, and against Jerusalem. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. In that day, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness, and I will open mine eyes upon the house of Judah and will smite every horse of the people with blindness. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength and the Lord of hosts their God. In that day will I make the governors of Judah like a hearth of fire among the wood and like a torch of fire in a sheaf, and they shall devour all the people round about, on the right hand and on the left, and Jerusalem shall be habited again in their own place, even in Jerusalem. And then there's this verse that a lot of people, we never really read this far down, but it says this. The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them in that day shall be as David. And the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. So I'm distressed. Um... You know, he was only a Facebook friend, okay? But um, he was one of those uh, larger-in-life guys. This is, uh, 
I don't know. I think it's big news. I think it's important at this time that we understand what is happening and what is going to happen and that people everywhere, whether it's China, America, the countries of Africa, Israel, and Judah need the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thanks for the guidance that it gives. Pray, Lord, that you always help us to remember the things that you taught us at the beginning. Bless us as we go this week. In Jesus' name, amen.